Hello everyone, my name is Chad Broom and I'm the pastor of the Trinity Bible Church. Um, today we just take a pause on our sermon series um, and we're just going to focus on this specific message today um, which I've entitled God's Master Plan. Um, it's a message that I often use at um, funeral services um, and in our church over this weekend we will be remembering one of our church members um, and so our service is going to be taking a slightly different format um, but I thought it would be just as good to share this this message um, for those of you who um, use this YouTube channel so um, let's just pray and commit this message um, and the sermon to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can come before you as our loving Father, but at the same time recognizing that you are a holy God and that you've called us to be holy just like you are holy. You've called us into a relationship with you. You have a master plan for our lives. And long before we even recognized that you cared about us and loved us, long before we even became children of God, you were at work. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that each one of us who listens to this message today would recognize that through life you are teaching us to become dependent on you. Through life's tests, through life's trusts, and through the, the transient temporary nature of life, we are being made aware that we need our Savior and we need to embrace the Master's plan. Speak to our waiting hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read a passage of Scripture that sets the tone, in a sense, and that reminds us that God certainly does have a master plan for our lives. And, and that master plan is to inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 um, verse 53 to 58 has to say. It says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable in, um, inherit the imperishable. Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body that we're in right now must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written that says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. God has a master plan for our lives. And it is to inherit the kingdom of God. To teach us to recognize and embrace the master's plan, he shows us that life is a test, that life is a trust, and that life is a temporary assignment. So let's have a look at that first of all. Life is a test, a trust, and a temporary assignment. First of all, life is a test. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. So, God doesn't want us to conform to the ways of the world. And therefore, he starts to test us. So, so here's, here's a question. How is your character formed and shaped? How is it actually formed and shaped? Well, it's formed and shaped and, and honed through life's tests. 
the um, James chapter 1 verse 12 puts it this way. Happy are those who remain faithful under trials, tests, difficulties. Because when they succeed in passing such a test, they will receive as the reward the life which God has promised to those who love Him. And so James is saying that life is a test and that our faith is tested through our trials. How do you know something is real and authentic until it's put to the test, right? You, you don't know its validity. You don't know its authenticity until it's tested. Take, for example, the common sleeping bag. Sleeping bags are put to the test and graded on the temperature that they can keep you snug and warm at. Some sleeping bags can handle the, 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 the sub-zeros for those incredibly cold conditions like high up on Mount Everest, minus 40 degrees. Now you wouldn't want to be caught in a snowstorm with a sleeping bag that couldn't actually live up to the claim live up to, to its claim to be a minus 40 sub-zero sleeping bag. And you're caught in a snowstorm at minus 40 and your sleeping bag can only handle plus 5 degrees. You're going to freeze. You might just die as a result of that sleeping bag not actually living up to its claim. A responsible hiker and mountain climber will have a tried and tested sleeping bag for the conditions they expect to encounter. They're not just going to take something off the shelf that they, they don't know has yet been proved. But when they say on that label, this has been tested to the following conditions, and generally it's been put through some, rig test, some rigorous testing, that means that you will be warm and snug at that level. At that, that's the coldest level with, with which you'll still be warm and snug, and you'll cope through a night's sleep. And so, a sleeping bag is tested, and then they write on, this, on the label what it can withstand, what you can, what you can handle. And that's a very important test, right? You would make sure that it must have been tested, and you will also compare out there in the marketplace from reviews from other people that it really does live up to that standard and that test. It's not a make-believe thing. It's not a, a thumb suck. They actually put it through real-world exposure and, ex and, and, and circumstances and situations to test its validity and to test its authenticity. It must be tested. Well, guess what? God tests your faith through your problems and challenges. If you say you love Jesus and you're a follower of Jesus, He will test your faith through your problems and challenges. Will you still remain faithful to Him? When all around you is crumbling, that's the test. Or are you a fair weather Christian who, who only really has faith when things are going well? So he tests your faith through your problems and your challenges to see if your claim is real. He tests your hope by how you handle your possessions. Think about it. In other words, where do you really put your hope? Is it in God or is it in material things? What are you really trusting in? When the chips are down, what's more important to you? Your creature comforts or God himself? God also tests your love through people. You see, think about it. The Bible says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. God tests us in these areas, in our faith, in our hope, in our love. When it comes to love, he tests us through people. That's just simply the way it's going to be. It's so easy to love those who love us and never offend us. If they, if they love us and they don't offend us, man, we will easily love them. But that's not real love then. It's not tested to be real. God tests the nature and the quality of our love for others and himself through difficult relationship circumstances. Um, this is a tough one because it, it cuts to the core of our being. Things like betrayal, hurt, 
lies, gossip, or just simple misunderstandings in relationships. Those are tests. Will we still be loving? Will we still show love when we're challenged by other people? That's the nature of real love. Real love is not a, a conditional thing. Real love is not, I will love you if you do things the way I like. Or when you do things the way I like. So real love doesn't say if and it doesn't say when. Real love loves. In fact, we see that in Jesus. For God loved us and died for us while we were still sinners. In other words, he proved his love on the cross where it was tested, where he was lied about, where he was spat on, and when he cried out, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In life, you will be tested by major changes, delayed promises, impossible problems, unanswered prayers, undeserved criticism, and even senseless tragedies. Some of life's tests seem overwhelming, don't they? While others, you don't even notice. But all of them have eternal implications. And through these tests, our faith can grow. Our hope can be strong in the Lord and our love can flourish. Because they tested and they, 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 they shaped and they honed and they proved to be true. And sometimes we'll fail those tests. But we'll learn from them. And if we learn from them, we grow and we grow stronger and more mature. And so that's why it says, happy are those who remain faithful under trials. Not faithful only when things are good. Because when they succeed in passing such a test, they will receive as their reward the life which God has promised to those who love Him. So life is a test, but life is also a trust. Everything we have on earth are gifts from God that He's entrusted to us. He says, these are things I want you to look after. These are things I want you to manage and care for. We are stewards, therefore, of whatever God has given us. And even when he created Adam and Eve and, and, he, and he gave us this world that we live in, he gave us responsibility for this planet. He's entrusted it to us. At the end of our lives, God's going to be, be taking stock and saying, what did you do with what I entrusted to you? What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with it? Was my name glorified or not? What are you doing with what God has entrusted to you? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your energy? What are you doing with your intelligence? What are you doing with your resources? What are you doing with your opportunities? And what are you doing with your relationships? He's entrusted all of those to you. So this links back to the fact that life is a test. And he's going to test us through the things that he's entrusted to us. And saying, what did you do with what I gave you? It's part of the test. Have you directed all these things that I mentioned? Your time, your energy, your intelligence, your resources, your opportunities, your relationships. Have you directed these things towards God? You put God first in all of those areas. You see, you and I need to learn to live life with as little regret in our lives as possible. We always will have some form of regret because we're sinners and we fall short of God's standards and we mess up. But we have a gracious, loving, forgiving, merciful God who wants to keep us growing and maturing even through these setbacks, even through these problems, even through our own failures. He wants us to grow. We don't grow unless we acknowledge, unless we confess. Unless we repent and we turn to the Lord and follow Him. So we need to live life with as little regret as possible because life's too short to hold on to grudges, too short to be wasted, too short to squander. It's just simply too short. You've got to live it for God. And so take what God has entrusted to you and serve Him and others with it. Whatever God's given you, Serve him and others with it.
Don't be a me first person. Be a God first person. Take what he's given you, open your hands, and serve God and others. And then the third element is that life is a temporary assignment. And, and when we come to a funeral service or a memorial service, we, we are so aware that life is short. And, and the Bible itself is full of, of these kinds of pictures, metaphors, about how temporary and brief life actu actually is. We see life being described as a breath. Life being described as a vapor or, or a wisp of smoke. Think about the temporary nature of these things. A mist that is there and then it vanishes. Breathe into the winter's air and you see your breath and then you watch it vanish. It's, this is not there permanently, it just disappears. Well, guess what? The Bible is saying your life is like that. Temporary. Brief. Don't think this is everything. Don't think this is all of it. Psalm 119 verse 19 says, I am here on earth for just a little while. That's temporary, right? There's, not, there's nothing permanent about that statement. Take Job chapter 8 verse 9. Job says, our time, well, in the book of Job it says, our time has been short like a fading shadow and we know very little like a fading shadow as the sun rises and moves we see shadows come and go our lives are like that just like a shadow 1 peter chapter 2 verse 11 i'm reading specifically from the paraphrased version of, of the bible called the message um, just because of the way it, it brings out the significance of when we think our lives are eternal, when we think our lives are, sorry, uh, when we think that this life on earth is permanent and eternal. So this is, this is what it says. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourself cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Notice that statement? This world is not your home. This is a temporary place. Don't make, your, make the mistake of getting all cozy in this life as though it's permanent. And, 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 and don't get so cozy in this life that you forget to take care of that which is real, which is eternal. The flip side of this idea that life is a temporary assignment is that for believers in Christ, there is an eternal home. And it's all part of God's master plan. There is an eternal home. There's our celestial home. There's the place that God is preparing for us in eternity. And it's all part of God's master plan. And I, I want to read you a poem that says this. When it comes to the end of the road and the sun has set for me. Now that's referring to death, okay? I want no rights in a gloomful room. Why cry for a soul set free? So this is the perspective of a Christian. Someone whose soul has been set free because of Jesus. Miss me a little, but not too long. And not with your head held low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. For this is a journey that we all must take. And each must go alone. It's all part of the Master's plan a step on the road to home heaven's our home this world is not our home so here's the second focus of my message today first of all we've seen that life is a test a trust and a very temporary assignment now we have a look at at, at understanding what is god's master plan well, listen to the master plan as described in John chapter 14. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. If this were not so or not true, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and do that, I'll come back. And I will take you to be with me 
then you will also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we even know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. God's master plan, folks, is to, is to provide peace for our souls. Notice the words in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. You see, trusting in God and, and faith in God brings peace to our souls. Now, it may not remove life's hardships or tragedies. It, it won't remove those things. But it brings peace to our souls. Have you found peace for your soul in the midst of life's challenges? Have you pursued a relationship with God? So that you find yourself to be at peace with God and that you're, 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 you have peace in your soul? Think of it this way. Your soul must find rest in God long before you are laid to rest or else it will be too late. So God's master plan is to provide peace for our souls and it's only done through Jesus. But God's master plan is also to prepare a place for our eternity. Isn't that cool? That's what, that's what John 14 says. I go to prepare a place for you. The King James Version says, In my Father's house are many mansions. And I'm, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. God is busy preparing your eternal dwelling and the dwelling of every follower of Jesus since the beginning of time. He's preparing that home and that place for you. The Bible portrays this life on earth as temporary. We've already said it. And so it's, it's the dress rehearsal. It's the curtain raiser. For the real life that is, that is yet to come, which is our heavenly life. He prepares and He provides peace for our soul, but He prepares a place for us in eternity. And God's master plan finally, finally, is to fetch us. His master plan is to return and fetch us. To take us to be with Him. It's one thing to know the peace of God through Christ. That's the one. And it's one thing to know that and you need to know that. And it's another thing to have a dwelling in heaven. But we need to know how to get there. Jesus promises to fetch his children. That's how we get there. Only through Jesus. The great shepherd knows each of his sheep by name. He assures us that death is not the end. And that he is coming to fetch his own and take him to be with him in heaven. Jesus gets us to heaven. What we have to do is place our faith and trust in him. And then he will return to fetch us. Have you got your eyes focused on the future? On your eternal reward? On heaven? Focused on God's master plan? Have you embraced God's master plan? Because without God's master plan, your life has a doomed plan. Only God's master plan gives us peace, gives us a place to live eternity in, and only God's master plan, and in only God's master plan, do we have one who will come and fetch us, take us to be with him. And so we look forward to that day when he returns to fetch us. Or we, 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 we go the route of death first. But either way, he'll still come and fetch us. And so the, the beauty of God's master plan is this. That there can be peace for our souls. And there can be a place where we spend eternity. And if you've ever been worried about that, God will come and fetch you. He'll send his son Jesus to fetch you one day. And that can only take place if you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. And during life, God's going to test your faith. He's going to test your hope. 
He's going to test your love to prove whether your faith is real. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that my faith over time will be proved to be real and authentic. I know the hardships and the difficulties of life, the challenges that come our way. And the people that are listening to this message know those hardships too. Sometimes brought about by our own sinfulness. Sometimes brought about by other people's sinfulness. Sometimes just life circumstances that we go through that are hard and difficult and terrible. May we prove to have faith in you in the midst of all these difficulties and challenges. And even in the face of the shadow of death and even in the face of death itself where we look at a loved one that's gone to be with our Lord and Savior and we're mourning their loss. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that even in the midst of that pain and heartache we can discover peace and joy deep within our souls. We thank you, Lord God, that you have a master plan and that you will come and fetch your own because you know us, you've named us, we are your children and you will fetch us and you will secure us and all this pain and heartache and trial and suffering will be past and our faith will be proved true and you will call us into your home and say, welcome, welcome into your rest. Father, we look forward to that day. Bless your people now in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, go with God. Have a great week.